And so this morning, um, we've got a message up there called um, Looking Ahead to 2018. And essentially what I'm wanting to share with you this morning is some vision, some planning um, for next year. And um, I shared this with the leaders about, um, about three weeks ago, and um, I got some input from our leaders. And uh, that was wonderful input, got their, their suggestions, changed a few things. And then a couple of them felt I needed to share this with you as well. And so uh, I have the privilege to, to share in essentially where I believe the Lord is leading us in 2018. So it's called Looking Ahead. And uh, the subtitle is called Catching Fish and Feeding Sheep. It's, it's all going to make sense in, in, a, in a few minutes. But essentially what I'm wanting us to do is to go a little higher, higher and, and kind of peek into, into 2018, where I believe the Lord is leading us. And... Um, I remember many years ago, I, uh, it was when Ratanga Junction just opened. Who's all been to Ratanga Junction? Most of us. I see most of the uh, old people have been. <laughs> They've got those loyalty cards and they go on the Cobra over and over again. <laughs> but most of us have been to Ratanga Junction or we know about Ratanga Junction. I remember when it just opened, it was very exciting. And we heard about this amazing theme park that's coming to Cape Town and uh, me and one of my friends, we went to Ratanga Junction, and man, it was like a treat. And one of the things, one of the rides that we did or took part on was called the Slingshot. Has anybody heard of the Slingshot? Anybody taken part? Who's done the Slingshot? Let's see. Oh, only three of us. Okay, so that says everything. Okay, so the Slingshot, the Slingshot, if you can go to that first slide. Don't go to the second slide, but go to that first, that first slide. This is essentially the, the, the slingshot. They strap you in this harness that apparently is quite safe. Um, and um, you, you don't, you know, you, you sign a few forms with a lot of small print that's actually too small to read. And then, and then they put you in this harness and um, it's kind of got this like, like this T, or not this T-bar, but this bar in the front that kind of, uh, kind of holds everything together. And then there's this pole about... I'd imagine about 50 meters behind it. And you kind of get put in this harness and this cable starts pulling you higher and higher and higher and higher and, and higher and higher. And if I mention higher and higher. Um, <laughs> and eventually, I remember me and my friend, we strapped into this thing and we're like all, you know, excited and we're giggling and we're chattering and it's like, this is going to be so amazing. And as we're going higher and higher, we talk less and less and... <laughs> And our eyes start going wider and wider, and, and eventually on some chip still. <laughs> and people, we were like, I don't, I don't know how many meters high, but we had this panoramic view. I don't even want to say of, the, the, of Cape Town. It was like of the Western Cape. You know, you kind of like <laughs> saw into Sierras and into France Hook and, you know, kind of nearly saw into South America, it, 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 was, it was seriously high. It was like Bloberg was down there and Table Mountain was over here. It, it was like, it was seriously high. And then I remember this, there was this guy at the bottom shouting through one of these bull's horns, but it's so high that you can't hear anything that he's, you know, shouting. It's just beep, 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 a little voice and kind of the wind's blowing it away and you, you realize, okay, now you are at God's mercy. And... Um, it's one of those things where you don't know. It's not, it's not one of those things where you pull and then you go down. You wait until they decide to pull. And I think they were trying to tell us kind of, are you ready? And we didn't know what they're saying. So you're just waiting. And all of a sudden, you just, the earth swallows you up. And, uh, you know, you pay a lot of money to go on something like this. And it's meant to be fun. But there's a picture, if you go to the next picture, which kind of describes. Um, that looks like fun, doesn't it? If you, if you look at those people, I mean, they look absolutely terrified. So, so, so that's, the, that's the slingshot. And uh, if you haven't done it, go and do it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I've motivated you to, to go and do it. But the reason why I'm telling you this story is essentially what we're doing this morning as a church, we're going up in the slingshot a little bit this morning. I promise not to, uh, to release it too quickly. In fact, for this morning, I'm not going to release it. We're all just going to go slightly higher. And we're going to peek, and we're going to get a bit of an aerial view of what I believe the Lord is laying on the leadership on mine, Jolene's heart, for what's in store for us for 2018. And so, 
To be able to look into the future and know where God wants to take you, I believe you, you need to know where He's brought you to and what He's just said to you, what He said to you in the past. And so I want to go back to the first scripture, or the first kind of short message I shared with you when I came here, you know, when, when uh, Pastor Heinrich and, and Tienz, when we started having the discussions around me coming here, one of the first things that we did was we, we kind of spoke to you, and I kind of uh, came here one, one Wednesday evening, and they, they kind of tested me and, and, and saw whether I could, could preach. And um, so they said, bring, bring a short word, you know, no pressure. I think Tienz gave me like one day before the time, you know, he kind of, you know, tested me a little bit. And, uh, and I said, Lord, what must I share with this church? It's really important. It's the first thing that I'm sharing with your people, with your flock here in, um, in Franschuk. And the Lord spoke to me clearly, said, share John 21 with them. And so I think you will remember many of you were here that night. And, and so I'm wanting to go back to that word because I believe if the Lord has spoken, we need to really open our ears and our eyes to what He's already said to us before we decide where we are going. Because obviously what He said to us is important for, for where we're going. And so if you have your Bibles with me, you can turn to, to John chapter 21. It's on the screen as well. And I'll read it for us. John 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, saying, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came into the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were, not me, although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. And so what I want us to do, I've done this before, but um, I feel it's important just to touch on it again. I want us to unpack this piece of scripture, which I believe the Lord is, is saying is important for us to understand. And the word is saying you're after these things, which, which means we need to understand there's a context to the story, which means something's just happened. And, and that which has just happened is the fact that Jesus has just died. Jesus has just died, and um, Mary Magdalene and some of the disciples, they, they've come to an empty tomb. They've found Jesus, or well, they haven't found Jesus. They've found an empty tomb. The angels have appeared to some people. And then Jesus once or twice started appearing to the disciples saying very little, not really interacting with these disciples. And so we need to understand this. This has been a traumatic experience for Jesus and his disciples. For three years, they've been ministering together. God has been using them powerfully. They've been doing signs, miracles, wonders. They've been, they've been seeing things that they've never seen in their lives. This man came and interrupted their lives, saying, leave your businesses, leave your, 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 your practice, Luke. Leave, leave being a doctor, follow me. Matthew, tax collector, follow me. Come, follow me. Simon, Peter, John, James, leave the fishing, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And so their lives got changed radically in a very short space of time. And Jesus becomes famous in a very sh a short space of time. And so, so th this was like a really, really intense experience that they've just been through. So after these things, it's, it's after those three years, we catch up with the story of here. And so let's, let's look at this. Jesus shows himself at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. 
the top, the smaller sea. So it's where Jesus began his ministry. He comes back to where he began his, manis- his ministry. And, and, and the disciples are there. And now you can think what's going on in the disciples' hearts. This ministry has just been stopped abruptly. In fact, they nearly lost their lives for being part of that ministry. And so where do we find Simon, Peter, and John, and James, and these guys? Again? They're back doing their old work. What they'd originally done. What their hands knew what to do. And Simon Peter says to them, I'm going fishing. They're saying, we're going with you. And that night they caught nothing. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Now, I shared this at prison ministry uh, on, 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 Thursday, on, th- uh, on Thursday. I know what it's like to go fishing and catch nothing. Okay? I must have been about... Um, I was probably about 10 years old, and uh, my grandfather and my dad decided to spoil us. And we were in Port Elizabeth on holiday, and um, we used to fish off the rocks a little bit. But they decided, no, all the men, all the boys, we're going to hire one of these charter boats. We're going to go deep sea fishing, and we're going to go and catch us some big fish. And, uh, man, we were excited. And, you know, you get up at like about 3 o'clock in the morning, and um, it's dark, and you come in there into the harbor, and you get onto this boat, and the boys are so excited, and... Man, I just can't wait out to get out there and catch some big fish, man. And um, we kind of chug out of the harbor and you kind of go around the, the, the pier, kind of where the harbor is protected and, and it's beautiful, kind of the sun is just starting to rise, you know. But there's these kind of these little waves that you kind of go over. And uh, I remember kind of standing there and like standing on the railing, kind of like uh, feeling like the Titanic, you know, like, wow, this is amazing. And um, we start going over these waves, you know, and we start going over some more waves. And all of a sudden, I start feeling a bit of an uneasiness. Ongemakkelijkheid, is onder in my maag, in my stomach. And uh, I'm like, ooh, this is a bit funny, but uh, I'm going to go catch some big fish. And... Uh, and the feeling starts getting more intense and more intense, and, and the lights start getting further and further away. And all of a sudden, there's, there's, there's something that erupted from deep downside. And the word talks about deep crying out to deep. And we're in the deep, and deep starts crying out to deep. And I said, I'm going to you. And uh, we start giving the fish some extra food that wasn't planned. And uh, I'm being a bit graphic, but that's what happened. And... Uh, my fishing experience starts becoming a fishing nightmare. Man, and I didn't catch one fish. I didn't catch one fish because I was down, man. It's not like the captain packs in like a spare mattress for those that get seasick. You lie on the corrugated iron sides of the boat with the bolt sticking up, you know. And I was just lying there and kind of careening and uh, just holding my stomach, pleading to God for mercy. And uh, I remember one, one of my friends that was fishing with me, he was still standing there laughing at me, kind of like, you know, sick oh, and he's just wanting to, you know, kind of throw in his next line. And it was a guy up there in the water. And so eventually a couple of us started getting sick. I think eventually the captain thought, okay, these guys, these are novices. Let's get them back to shore. And I praise God. When I, I think I still kissed the ground when I came back to shore. The point is, the point is, I know what it's like to catch nothing. And that night, these hardened, trained fishermen that have been fishing these waters since they were lighty, since they were small kids, they work the whole night and they catch, they catch nothing. So you can imagine kind of their state, you know, been working, been grafting the whole night, throwing the net in and out, in and out, and there's, there's nothing. And um, we see Jesus steps into the, into the picture and he calls from the shore and he says, Children, have you any food? And they say, No. And he says to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat. And you can kind of imagine that the word says they were 200 cubits. That's 91 meters from the shore. So you can't exactly see who, who's standing there. And it's probably still slightly dark. And, um, and so they say, Look. We don't know who the stranger is that's calling out there from the shore, but, you know, if he's telling us to go for the right, you know, we've caught all nothing, Let, let's listen to the stranger. Maybe he saw a fish jumping or something. So, so they throw the net out there where they've just been fishing all night, and the word says kind of the boat is nearly sinking. An amazing thing that happens. No, nobody tells them that this is Jesus. But the word says, therefore, that 
the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, this is John writing this, okay? John's writing this story, and he's saying, The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's me, John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. He recognizes Jesus by the miracle that's just taken place. So they know that a miracle has just taken place. All night they've been fishing. They know these waters. All of a sudden their boat is nearly sinking. And they remember, who's done this before? Who's told us that right there where we've just been fishing? Throw it on the other side of the, of the boat. And you can nearly not contain the fish. It's Jesus. And they cry out to Jesus. And I shared last time, there's a bit of humor for me in this story. And it's like um, Peter realizes this, it's Jesus. And I, I don't know if it's just me that... That finds us funny, from, but, but, but the word says, now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he puts on all his clothes and he jumps into the sea. And one day when I get to heaven, I'm saying, Peter, why did you put on all your clothes before you jumped into the sea? And the rest of the disciples, they come in slowly on the little boat. And you, man, you just need to, I think, understand Peter's personality. He's over the top. He's just so excited. It's not like he, he takes, I would have taken off my clothes and sw- swam. He puts on all his clothes. I, I mean, he nearly drowned, I would imagine. Eh? And he, swims out to Jesus. He just he wants to get their their, their fosters. Even in, in, in the story before, you know, when they found the empty tomb, John writes about him and how him and Peter they basically write race each other to the tomb. And then John writes, I came there first. You know, so there was this this constant, constant struggle. And it says, and 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 the and, and the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved outran the other disciple. And so we see this kind of this interpersonal tension that's playing off between Peter and John. And Peter's going for it, he's swimming to Jesus, he wants to get to Jesus. And then something happens, and there's a scene that's set that I'm wanting us to, to have a look at. And I, I did this last time as well, but Jesus says to him, Come, eat breakfast. And Jesus got a little fire going over there. And uh, I did my little fire thing last time as well. But so yeah, here's the fire that um, this one, William drew. Is this the right way? No, this way. There's, there's the flames. This is Margaret's fire. As you can see, uh, everything's pink, you know. So uh, in our lives, everything needs to be pink. So when I make a fire, she'll say to me, Papa, can you work a pink fear, Mark? So that fire is not good enough. So she wants a pink fire. So, uh, so I asked them to draw a fire for me. So we've got a little fire going over here. And uh, I'll put it over there for us. And, and Jesus got a bit of a braai going over there. It's my little camp braai rooster. And uh, he's got some fish that's, that's, that's on the on, on the, f- the, f- the, the, the fire there, and there's, there's some coals there, and there's some bread that's over there. And so we've got this scene that's set over here, and um, the two main people that's in the scene is Jesus and Peter, okay? So they're kind of sitting over here, and there's a couple of other disciples that are sitting around as well. And then a conversation takes place, and I'm wanting us to just quickly read that conversation. I call it the love conversation. It's actually three conversations that's taking place here. And Jesus knows that this is going to be a tough conversation. You see, the last time that Jesus and Peter spoke, it was around the fact that Peter said, I'll never deny you. And so I've gone and looked. I can't see another conversation again after that, specifically between Jesus and Peter. And so a lot has happened. Jesus has died. He's, been, he's, he's, he's risen again. He's appeared once or twice to the group of disciples. But it doesn't seem like Jesus and Peter has ever caught up after their last conversation. And the last conversation went pretty much like, you know, Peter, you know, you, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, Lord, I will never, ever deny you. I will never deny you. And we know the story when push came to shove and a slave girl challenges him and says, but your accent is, is like the one who's being crucified, who's being tortured. Peter starts backing off and says, I don't know the man. And when somebody else starts challenging him and saying, but, but you're one of them, you're one of them. He says, I swear to you, I don't know that man. Three times, three times he denies Christ. And then the rooster crows and Peter remembers Jesus' words. And he's grieved. And so you kind of have to put yourself in in Peter's shoe. This is a passionate disciple. This is a a disciple who who claimed and said, I will go with you. Wherever you go, Jesus, I will go with you. But he denied Christ. And so he had a lot to deal with. He had a lot to deal with the fact that he'd let Jesus down. 
And I don't know if he ever thought that he would he'd get a chance to speak to Jesus again. And so now you can imagine his excitement when he realizes Jesus is on the shore and he's swimming out to Jesus. And now they have this conversation. And I said to the guys on, on, on Thursday, it's amazing. It says, when they had eaten breakfast, to a magis vol was begin die manne praat. And I don't know about you men, but uh, I suffer from anger pains. That's now a combination of being hungry and anger, angry. Because you normally get angry because you're hungry. Does anybody else get, does anyone get hang? Does anyone get hangry? Yeah, hangry. Okay, there's, there's a few of you. The rest are saints. Okay. But, but when, when my, my blood sugar drops, then I, I tend to become slightly kort van lont. You weet, I'm slightly irritable. And so it's amazing how Jesus realizes that they're going to have this tough conversation and he, he gives them food to eat and then they have the conversation. And so the conversation goes, goes something like this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? And he's pointing, he's pointing to the 153 large fish that are right, lying there. He's saying, Simon, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than what you know what to do? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus says again to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter says to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. By this time, the disciples on the right hand side, you can see their eyes are starting to get a bit big because in the Hebrew culture, you know, when you ask a question once and you get the answer that you kind of expect to respond, that's enough. When you start asking it a second time, it, it starts getting slightly uncomfortable. And I think the, the other disciples that are standing around, that they realize something's going down here. Jesus is trying to make a point. And Jesus said to them, to Peter, tend my sheep. And then we kind of get this really, really uncomfortable third-time question. He says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? By this time, it's chip still. And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so there's three conversations that are going on here in this passage of Scripture that we've, we've, just, we've just kind of unpacked. And the, the first one has got to do around fishing. Around fishing. Remember the title of this morning's sermon is Catching Fish and Feeding Sheep in the context of what we're going to be doing in 2018. Catching Fish and Feeding Sheep. And so in this story, fish is a, is a major, is a major principle. And just as Jesus has taught them many times to catch the fish, once again, they're catching fish. Fish is the object of their discussion. They remember the day that Jesus stepped into their lives and said, you're no longer going to catch these things. You're going to catch men. Follow me. I will teach you to catch men. And so the whole thing of, of catching men, of catching women for the gospel, is featuring strongly in this kind of, this last conversation that they have with Jesus again. It featured right in the beginning when he called them, and now it's featuring right at the end. They're speaking fish, fish terminology again. The second thing that, that's taking place here is a love conversation. So the first thing is a fish conversation. They know that fish doesn't just mean fish. Fish means people. The second thing is a love conversation. And so it's interesting. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Because three times Peter denied Christ. And so this is an important conversation. It's an important conversation, and it's got to do with love. It's got to do with the response to love. What does that love look like? And so if it, people, it doesn't get clearer than this. Jesus is saying, by default, to all of us this morning as well, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes. He says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs. And so the third conversation is a shepherding conversation, a sheep conversation. The first one is a fish one. The second one is a love one. And by default, 
We were having a shepherding conversation. And so what I'm wanting to say to us as we're going slightly higher today, as I'm peaking, as the leadership is peaking into 2018, what do I believe the Lord is saying to us? He's wanting us to have a conversation around our calling to be fisher, fishers of men and women. He's wanting to know, do we really love Him? Do we really know the love of Christ? Do we really understand it? And if we understand it, what will 2018 look like? What will we be busy with? What will our small groups look like? What will we be praying for? What will we be discussing in church? What fire needs to start burning in our hearts? And the third thing I believe he would ask us is, if you love me, do you listen and obey my word? And then go feed my sheep, tend my sheep, and feed my lambs. What does that mean? What does it mean? All this fishing lingo, all this shepherding jargon. What what does all of this this mean? Jesus spoke in parables to people that understood those industries, that, that, that were shepherds, that were fishermen. And so if we just unpack this, this whole thing of shepherding, I believe we all understand what it means to be fishers of men, fishers of women, and our call that we all mean to go and do what my kids sing. Fish fang for Jesus, fish fang. They sang it this way. Fish fang for Jesus, elke dag. Bible in the hand, calf foot in the sand. Fish fang for Jesus, elke dag. They know it from a young age. Fishing for Jesus. So we know what it means to fish for Jesus. I would imagine all of us, if we were challenged this morning, if Christ walked into here and had to ask each one of you, do you love me? I believe everybody here would say, I love you, Lord. And then the challenge would be, what does that love look like? Does it translate into this final thing, the shepherding conversation? Now, my grandfather, he he had a sheep farm in the northeastern Cape, and... um, Man, he was a great sheep farmer. He, uh, he, oh, he, I mean, he was a national judge. He did these merino sheep for their wool. And uh, I think he was one of seven judges. And, and he said, Rama, buy a competition. And he even went on the boat to Australia to go and get a stud there and bring it back and breed like top quality uh, rams. He really, really knew how to farm and how to farm with sheep. And I have such memories. We used to go there at least twice a year you know, school holidays, go to the farm, and just, I was around sheep a lot. I can still vividly remember kind of how they felt when you kind of like, sometimes challenged me to go and tackle a sheep. He used to work on my rugby skills as well, you know, and sometimes I'd go and have to tackle one of those big sheep, you know, which was, was, was lots of fun. But I remember kind of going into, into the shearing shed and going into the, and, and, and he baller, and die 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 vol baller, and playing in the wool, Yes, that's me. That's me. <laughs> Thought you're laughing at my story. You're laughing at me. <laughs> that, that's probably me. I would imagine nine or ten years old. That's one of the Hans Lammerkies that he caught, had there near the at the house, and that's a my, my grandfather was quite a, a man's man. So he smoked Gunston and drank J and B. That's a J and B bottle with milk in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a J&B whiskey bottle it's got some lacquer malkies in and uh, and uh, yeah. and so he so man I've got all these 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 memories of of kind of working with a sheep and and playing in those those vorbala and kind of they must slightly oily the wool and kind of being covered in that and um, just the smell of, of uh, uh, you know just a lot of sheep in one place and uh, three things that my grandfather, as a good shepherd, as a good sheep farmer, as a stockman, did. So number one, I remember going down nearly every afternoon, and we went and counted the sheep. Okay? We went and counted the sheep, and like I said, you know, he, 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 he smoked way too much um, Gunston cigarettes. Those without filters. It's the most hardcore cigarette. He was, a, he was quite a hardcore dude. In the 50s, he used to go elephant hunting in Rhodesia, you know. Back in the days when that was a manly expression to go and hunt an elephant, you know. These days, it's like you're a poacher. But, but in the 50s, there were lots of elephants, too many elephants. Uh, he'd disappear in the bush, you know, for three months at a time and uh, just go track elephant and lion and buffalo and um, absolutely loved the felt and the bush felt. You know, he would make recordings. Um, 
of the bushveld, and he'd come back to the farm, and then his treat at night was to sit there with a kopi buddha through us, and he would play just the sounds of the bush, and just listen, and listen, and listen. Loved the felt, loved the felt, loved animals, loved his sheep, loved his sheep. And we would walk with him to the, to the skaap, na die skaap kraal uh, toe, and, um, and I remember he would stand there with his, take out his little constant packet and his pen, and then the boys would count the sheep. They'd jump from one crawl to the next, and he would stand there, and he would count. Count his sheep. Count his sheep. Some people say we mustn't count our people in church. You know, it's, don't, don't, don't count people. I say we count people because people count. And uh, if a, a good shepherd knows exactly what's going on, a good farmer knows stock levels, what's going on. And so we encourage our leaders to know what's going on, to follow up our sheep, to know where, who's where and, 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 and who's doing what. And so the first thing he did is he'd count his sheep, okay? The second thing that he would do is he'd make sure that his sheep got a healthy diet. And so apart from the, the, the food that they would get, the lucerne and, and all those things, I remember getting in his big Ford truck and we'd drive around on the farm and... Um, it's like a great salt lekker gehad, these big salt licks, you know. I don't know if some of the farmers might know what I'm talking about. It was basically a big block of salt, and he kind of chuck it off the back of the bucky, and, and all these sheep would run, and they'd start licking the salt. And there's these other things, uh, you had it for say, molasses, you know. Sometimes I got stuck into the molasses, but they all laughed at me last time. But it's, it's salty, it's like marmite, but a bit of sugar in it or something like that. And, um, and these sheep would get a balanced diet, and that's why they won competitions. And so a healthy sheep has got a balanced diet. And so you guys really need to pray for me and Johnny and the leaders here, the preacher, so that we give you a healthy diet. And, and that's why it's so, it's, it's so exciting when Tians, he called me yesterday, he says he's in town, he knows it's late, but, but can he share a word? I'm like, you're preaching tomorrow. Because we need the evangelists in town. I'm not a natural evangelist. The Lord is working on me to be an evangelist, but we need evangelists, we need teachers, we need prophets, that's why when Graham is sharing next week, we need the gift of the prophet, and so I'm trying, I'm trying to look at the preaching schedule, I'm trying to make sure you guys get a balanced diet, Tienza's spreadsheet last year, he worked it out, man, who's preaching what, what week, and then he had another column there, and he said, uh, this person is, a, is evangelist, this one's a teacher, this one's an apostle, this is a prophet, percentages, man, your previous pastor worked out your diet to the T. Luckily, I can just copy and paste that spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> but our sheep need a balanced diet to be healthy sheep. So that's the second thing. The first thing, you make sure um, that they counted. The second thing, you make sure that they've got a healthy diet. The third thing, we're talking about feeding sheep now. Feeding sheep. The third thing that, that, that Jesus said to Peter, he said, Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, and tend my sheep. What does it mean to tend sheep? To tend sheep, in my opinion, it means he puzzle up. Okay? And you give them, in a sense, what they need. Now, sheep need a whole bunch of things. I remember there on the farm, there'd be this, this concrete, like, hollow in the ground, and uh, it was called the scarp dip. Okay, so it's probably about this deep. It's got like a, a cementing that goes down and then it's flat and it's probably about that deep and then it goes up again. And then these sheep would be herded into this thing and they'd fill this thing up with water and they'd take these big canisters of basically poison, but good poison for the stuff that it needs to kill. And so all the kind of the ticks and the fleas and the, the, the I don't know what sheep get, lice and, 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 and all kind of things, parasites that would want to jump onto them they walk through this dip, they don't like it at all, you know, they start blaring and they, they're very unhappy to go through this and it smells funny and I would imagine it itches a bit if you're a sheep, I've never had that experience. Um, <laughs> but, um, but so they go, through, they go through this dip and they come out the other side and they, they're a bit unhappy, but it's good for them. And so sometimes the shepherd needs to give the inoculations and say, Man, there's this new funny doctrine that's being preached or there's this new fad or this new fashion or this new church that seems to be the, the, the thing, but it's not quite the truth. And Jesus warns us in the, in the final days, people are going to come preaching stuff that's for the itchy ears. And so our jobs as, as shepherds and as leaders of this church, church is to make sure that we tend you, 
I remember my grandfather putting this, this thing on his back, like an old version of the camel back, the 1950s version, and, and the spate, he had this, this thing in his hand, this gun, and he'd open, they'd open those sheep's mouths, and he'd stick it in there, they didn't like it at all, and he'd stick it deep down their throat, and he'd, he'd squirt them, and he'd give them their dupa, what they needed. And sometimes it's going to be like this. Jesus is saying you love people, you count them, you feed them, you make sure that they're safe. And so that's we as, as leaders, we commit to being shepherds of you. But many of you are going to shepherd people next year as well. I really believe the Lord. I'm going to share now, now what the Lord has specifically asked us. But he's going to raise up a lot of shepherds sitting right over here. And the Lord is saying, you love me. Have a heart for my shepherd, not for my sheep, not just for my sheep. He specifically singles out the lambs. God wants us to look after the little ones, to feed them, to tend them. Jesus was passionate about children. He called the children close to him. And so children's church and children is going to be one of our main focuses next year. I'm going to share about that. About that in a bit. And so if you ask me, Richard, you're jacking us up on this, this high slingshot today, and you're taking us high, and you're kind of making us see what 2018 potentially looks like if the Lord leads us in there. And I'm saying we're going to have three conversations next year. It's going to be around catching fish. And let me tell you, I'm not a natural fisherman, but the Lord has started a process with me last year, and He said, I'm going to make you, Richard, into a fisher of men. And I've been on a bit of a journey. And I'm going to start off next year by, by sharing around that. I'm going to start challenging us around becoming fishers of men. Some people will say, it's just Tienz's job in African Enterprise and Stephen Lunga and Angus Bucken and Reinhard Bonker. They're the, they're the big fishermen. Yes, they are the big fishermen. Did Jesus say they must just go and catch fish? No, he expects all of us, all of us to become fishers of men and women. So... That's the first thing that's coming. The second thing that he's led us on is this love, this love conversation. And, and God is challenging us. And he's saying, do you understand my love? And I remember when Tians asked me to, to share this message, I shared this, this, this scripture with you. And the week after that, Pastor Heinrich, our leader, introduced the topic for convergence that year. And the, the top of this year, and it was called, Where's the Love? I said, yes, Lord, I heard right. I heard right. And so the theme for next year is known for love, hashtag known for love. And so if you will look at those things on the side there, that's not just stuff to make the church look pretty. That, I see our light boxes aren't on today. JP, sit them some of our unfors. On the linker can switch them on. Look at that. Hashtag known for love. That's not just up there because we needed something to put against the wall. That's the main thing, guys, for 2018. We can be known for many things in this valley. But will we be known for love? Because Jesus is saying, you love me, catch fish and feed sheep. And so the last thing that I believe the Lord is, is, is going to do, he's going to raise up shepherds. Raise up shepherds in our midst. So what does this look like specifically? Okay, Richard, you're saying we're going to have three conversations, catching fish the love conversation, and feeding and tending sheep. What does this translate into practically? Give us practical examples. And so that's what I'm going to spend the last few minutes sharing with you. And it, it gets very, very kind of uh, practical. And um, so we've prayed, the leadership have prayed, me and Jolene have prayed. And uh, I felt the Lord saying we need to focus on six, six focus areas for 2018. And I'm going to speak about those all individually. The first one is, is Sunday services. Second one, intercession, small groups, uh, a building project that we're about to embark on, uh, social justice, and, and the final one, discipleship. There's a lot of other things that we can also focus on. But I believe the Lord is calling us to, to really hone in and, and to, to put all our energy and focus and attention on these six areas. So the first thing is Sunday services. So like I said to the leaders, I've never passed the church before I came here. I've looked after big districts and, and, and a lot of small groups uh, in Stellenbosch, but I've never had the responsibility of, of, of looking after a flock. And so the first thing me and Jolene did when we heard we, we've been called here, yeah, we phoned all the pastors in Shofar that are getting it right. Uh, so the Andre Krugers in, in, in East London, Andre and Sonica, the Andres van der Mervis, the, the Val who preached the other day whose church is booming in Marmesbury. 
uh, Ross and Machrik, the, the people that are really getting this whole church thing right, this pastoring thing right, and we Skyped with them, and we went and had coffee with them for two or three hours, and we said, please, just we're listening. Tell us everything you know. Tell us all the mistakes that you've made that we don't need to make them as well. And so they shared a couple of things, and the one thing that they said is, we need to put a lot of effort and focus and attention on our coming together on a Sunday. And so I started reading up about this on, on the internet a little bit, and um, one of the articles that Sia sent to us was called Eight Reasons, Eight Reasons Why People Come Back to Your Church. Very, very insightful article. And, um, and you won't believe some of the reasons why people come back to church. So, in fact, I want to ask, what do you think is the number one reason that people come back to your church? Now, the leaders, they've already heard this, so you're not allowed to answer. So the rest of you, what, what to listen to? Because I've got the Word of God, yeah? That's a good one. Biscuits? I've got biscuits. <laughs> you know, the, the, the funny thing is I've heard a quote from Reynard Bonker. He said, the less Holy Spirit you have, the more cookies and coffee you need. <laughs> so, 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 so Reynard is hardcore. We believe in co- uh, cookies and coffee in this church, so don't worry. We're not taking any cookies and coffee. But, but, but it makes you think a little bit, okay? Um, somebody else said something here. Feel welcome. Yes, so that, that, that whole thing of, of feeling welcome when you come to church. So I've got the word feeling welcome, cookies and coffee. What else? Love. Man, you got, who's, love and family, amen, it's like you guys have been reading the article, eh? The one thing that you haven't said, the number one reason, according to the survey in, in, in North American churches, the number one reason why people come back to your church is if they experience God. That makes you think, eh? So we're going to have cookies and coffee and light boxes and sound systems and everything. If God's not there, according to statistics, not, not according to some Christian thing, according to statistics, people will not come back to your church. People come to church for God. That's our reward. If He meets with us, hallelujah. And that's why Jolene brought that incredible word for us. That was the word for us. We need to create space for the Holy Spirit in our services. That's the main thing people come to church for. The second thing was the word, the word. In fact, that was the third thing. The, the, the second thing is, is an important one. It's if people trust the leadership. It's the role of leadership is so important. The word. Worship actually wasn't such a big deal. They said as long as the people don't sing false, then it's all right. People will come. We praise the Lord in our band. Nobody sings false. They, they're, all, they're all wonderful, Okay. The other main reason why people come back to your church is because of your kids' church. So they say, you can have an amazing experience, amazing time of worship, amazing word. But if little Johnny had a bad experience in your kids' church, they're going to try the church down the road. Now that's not the main reason why we're going to put a massive focus on kids' church in 2018. The reason why we're going to put a massive focus on kids' church is because Jesus said we must look after and feed and tend the lambs as well as the sheep. But kids' church, if you just want to look for growth levers to pull in your church in terms of growing your church, that's one of the, 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 top, the top ones. Kids' church is essential. So, so we've been praying a lot about that. So that Sunday services, Sunday service is a big deal. We're going to start praying a lot more for Sunday services. On Sunday mornings, we're going to be coming together as leadership teams and interceding for the services. I tell you, if God moves in these services, you're going to have a lot less meetings in the week because a lot of problems are going to be sorted out here on a Sunday morning. So Sunday service is a big thing. We're going to start getting passionate about Sunday. Sunday is going to be a big deal for us. And you know what? The rest of this town is going to start knowing it as well. We're going to be confident inviting other people to experience what we're experiencing on a Sunday morning. Number one. Number two. Intercession. I was a bit naughty and I put this, this uh, picture of this pastor, this solo figure, uh, interceding for the church. Um, because this is how our intercession has been for, for quite a long time. Um, so the pastor is praying, Lord, please send the other intercessors. 
to, uh, to come pray for our church. Ours is actually slightly better than that because a realistic Virgava or picture would be Tani Betsy on that side and Tani Joanne on this side. We, we had three people until recently. But hallelujah, that has changed. On Thursday evening, we had 10 people at intercession. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and you know what? It's a small start. But the Lord has spoken clearly to, to Jolene, especially to Jolene and, and to my heart. The things that we need to do in 2018 are going to be birthed in intercession. Now, I'm going to prophesy and speak. Intercession is going to become one of the most exciting and powerful meetings in our church. That's why we took a precious slot on a Thursday evening where we're normally doing some marriage course or some course, and we said, we're booking it out. Intercession moves from early on a, a Wednesday morning when most people are on their way to work to 7 o'clock on a Thursday evening. It's just one hour, one hour, seven to eight, not a minute past eight. And we had an amazing time on, uh, on Thursday night just interceding, praying for ten things, ten things, including parliament and everything on the Friday. It was powerful. And I believe that that meeting is just going to grow. In fact, the next time we meet, we're going to be meeting in here. So intercession is going to be a major focus for us. The third thing, small groups. I've had a couple of leaders come and speak to me and, and share a couple of things around small groups. And uh, what I want to say to this church is you've got amazing small groups. Amazing small groups. You've got amazing small group leaders. You know, one of the, the biggest blessings of, of coming to pass this church is we step into a leadership ring where we've got a bunch of mature leaders. I don't have to raise up leaders. I don't think even Tian's had to raise up leaders. These leaders have been coming for years. And so we've got great leaders. We've got great small groups. The only things that I've said to them, after the Lord has spoken to me and after some of the leaders have spoken, our small groups are too big. There's no more space for growth. There's no more space for growth in our small groups. And I know, guys, this is uncomfortable to hear, but I'm going to say it boldly. Our small groups are too big. Our small groups are too big. And uh, I remember coming to Stellenbosch seven years ago and... Uh, and being part of a small group, and we had an amazing small group. We were about eight or ten people in that small group. And week after week, you know, we'd have this amazing uh, time of, of small group. But then the Lord challenged us, there must be new water that flows into this pool. We're becoming stagnant. And so what happens is we, we become comfortable in those relationships. And that's not a bad thing. Christ made us to be relational. And it was uncomfortable when that district leader came to me and says, you need to multiply. And I said, what? No. Never. That's not us. We love each other. We're going to be in small group till we go to the old age home. You know what? It was uncomfortable in the beginning. And then new people, new blood started flowing in man, and the dynamics changed. And some people said, I can't do my good deal with them. They don't know me. Ah oh, man, two, three months later, they were their best buddies, you know, and they were sharing all their personal stuff. I tell you, there's something that kicks in when we're open to the fact that new water, new blood is going to start flowing, and we're going we're gonna to br break it down to the core, and a whole bunch of people that are sitting in small groups now, you're going to be small group leaders in 2018. And we're going to start multiplying, multiplying. Things that are small can multiply. Once they get too big, it becomes really complex to multiply something. And so that's the amazing thing that the Lord has spoken to us. The picture that the Lord gave me so, so specifically said you need to go and buy new fishing nets. We go to that next slide. We need to buy fishing nets. We're going to go fishing next year. We need new fishing nets. We're going to mend the old fishing nets, but our old fishing nets, they're great. We need more fishing nets, which means we need more small group leaders to bring people in and to look after them. More nets, more shepherds. Small groups, that's the third thing. Number four, the building project. Guys, I'm so excited about this. I feel like I can't sleep at times. Um, but the Lord has spoken, spoken clearly to us. Who remembers the morning Stephen Lugu came and, and shared a few months back here? It's only about three months ago. And what did he say to us? He said, when I come back, I don't want you in the same building. Who remembers that? When I come back, I don't want to see you in the same building. Since then, 
We've had at least two or three other words, clear words, as people have prayed for us and for the leadership. Extend the ten pegs. Maak die skip groter. Maak die skaapkrale groter. I'm telling you, I'm not coming up with that idea. We've got enough work yet to do as it is. But the Lord has spoken to us, extend your capacity to catch fish and to look after sheep. And so Tiens has already started that process for us of the building project and it's done all the groundwork and got plans uh, uh, drawn up for us. And so that's, that's the plans that we got over here. I'm just going to be sharing around phase one here quickly. Phase one is this, this green part over here. So basically, this is the long, the long part of the building. So yeah, so basically, if you had to flip it like this, you would know where we are now. So basically, I'm, I'm standing preaching at you this way. And so basically, what we're going to do, phase one of our building project is to extend this, this wall back nine meters, 9.2 meters. It's the space that we've got on that side. I think you can, you know, see that this morning when we have a relatively big service, there's not too much capacity for growth. And so we, in, in effect, we're actually sending signals that growth is capped right now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this wall back nine meters. They're going to start building, I would imagine, in the first quarter of next year. And uh, we're meeting on Tuesday night as the building committee. And we're making a call on who's going to, who's going to, who we're going to appoint. We've got four quotes in. And um, we're going to extend this whole, this whole wall basically back um, nine meters, basically take or build a new stage, a concrete stage, and then take all of this um, that way. And that's going to give us space for about an extra 100 chairs, okay? So initially it might feel a bit crick crick in here, and uh, there might be a lot of space there at the, at the back, but I've got a plan for that, so don't worry. Um, we're going to do a lot of fellowship in the back like they do in other churches, and you actually you grow into your space. But the Lord is saying to us, make the ship bigger, make the sheep pen bigger. And um, so phase one is, is, is moving that that nine meters back. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that whole building project. We're not even going to know about it. They're going to build, build all of that on that side. And in the final week, they can knock this wall through of this, and the next week we will be ready for church in our bigger venue. Amen? Amen. 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 It's very, very exciting. <laughs> the other part that the, the leadership felt is part of phase one. I actually got, I got seriously excited about phase two, but I'm, I'm parking that for now. This morning we're talking about phase one. The Lord said to us, if all these people are going to come, we're going to become fishers of men. And the Lord is speaking to us about feeding the lambs. There are going to be a lot of young ones that are going to come in here. And at the moment, our children's church teachers, they are surviving up there. You know, It's like, I think the year two to eight are in the same venue. Now, I don't know if you've ever had... 32 to 8 year olds in, in one little venue. It's, it's pretty chaotic. So they're kind of just surviving the services. And so they're pleading with us, please do something. And so, uh, so what we're going to be doing is um, in the parking lot there at the back as you actually drive up here, on the right-hand side, we're going to be creating a new uh, venue for Children's Church. And so we're looking at all the options. We're looking at um, uh, quick, quick housing options. It's called Quick Space. It's uh, what the ed Department of Education uses. Very, very um, impressive kind of uh, uh, classrooms that they build with aircon and plugs and uh, electricity and, and uh, insulation. And um, we're going to plant a lot of grass there and jungle germs. And we're going to create an amazing space for the lambs to be fed. And uh, so I'm, I'm personally very, very excited. We're going to be putting a lot of focus on our, on our, on our kids' church um, going forward. The, the, the final thing that I just want to say around this whole thing of, of creating space. We don't just have a, a, a church here. Or be built it on Kerk. At the moment, we've got enough space there. So praise the Lord. That venue, the rugby club, is still serving us in an amazing way. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of growth that, that needs to take place. There. So, so in, in that sense, our venue is, is great there at the top. What I have said to them is that venue must look as nice as this venue. So you'll see Mojas built wooden casings for that side. They get proteas and flowers. There's no distinction. The same thing that happens here must happen there as well. So I'm very, very excited about what the Lord is going to do. To the world. Amen. Okay, our second last one over there. The Lord has been speaking extremely clearly around social justice. So we as the leadership have been praying all year. 
been coming through in our intercession. And then those that were at Convergence will remember, Friday night, Friday night uh, Courtney Becker said, pure and undefiled religion is this, that you take care of the widows and orphans in their distress. Saturday main session, Pastor Ross Van Eker, stand bef- between the living and the dead. And he shared how they, they adopted their heart towards streams of social justice. So I cannot deny it. The Lord has spoken to us about, about orphans, about homeless children. And we've already started that again. Tians, I'm so glad that you, that you are here this morning. We can just honor Tians for doing all the groundwork for the building project, for Kibwe. He's already set all those things in motion that we can just step into this morning. So we, we've got a really, really exciting idea and concept for all our community development um, and for Kibwe. I can't quite share around that. A couple of blocks still need to fill, uh, fall into place. But when that does, we're going to launch that uh, in a big way. What I can share at this stage is people like Yanni and David. I don't know if they're here this morning. But Yanni and David have just organically just started training up musicians from the township, from from, from, from Grundal, mostly underprivileged areas, yeah. And uh, they got nearly 10 students that they're that they lecturing on a weekly basis. They're going to be building out that music school uh, in a massive way. In fact, they're launching it next Sunday. I've asked them uh, to launch it when Uncle Graham shares next Sunday. They're going to be launching the music, um, I want to call it workshop or project, and we're going to hear more about that. The second thing that we're going to be doing is Sister Liesel here in the front, she's going to be launching a sewing project as part of our community development. She's been in the industry for 20 years. She's a professional seamstress, and she's already done this. Everything that we, we, we're going to be doing next year, we've we trained in. And uh, what a privilege to have Liesel um, taking the young ladies under on our flag, and she's going to impart skills to them. Amen. Give her a hand. Liesl. And so... Um, we're going to be working a lot closer with Evelyn and the children. We're going to be getting a lot more involved. And uh, the Lord is really preparing us as, as, a, as a church, stirring our hearts um, to embrace all of these, these things uh, under one roof. So I'll share a bit more about that. The last thing I want to touch on this morning is just general discipleship and ministry. You know, there's so many things that we, that we can focus on. When I share this with the leadership, they said, but what about missions? And I said, we, we will always do missions. In fact, you know, when Johnny's going to the Ukraine next year, I think September and October, I'm going to India. Hopefully I can join him in the Ukraine as well. well we will always be involved in missions. What I want to say around missions is next year, the main mission field is this valley over here. We will do international missions. We will reach out to the rest of, of this country and, and, and this province. But the main thing I felt the Lord is saying, our mission field is down the road. And so that's, that's one of the main things. The other thing is Stefan and his men's events. Are, uh, Friday men's events are still going to be going. What are we gonna, We're going to tweak the men's uh, breakfast model slightly. We're going to go for one big event a quarter. Stefan, I've not met you yet, but I have a great dream. So our first men's event over here is going to be called the Men's Big Day Out. And we're going to have a tent here. We're going to have a band here. We're going to have archery. We're going to have... Um, uh, karre, mooi karre om na te kyk, ons gaan poikie kos, ons gaan spit braai, ons gaan groot gaan, and then we're going to preach the gospel. But we're going to invite all of us, all the men sitting here, we're going to bring at least two unsaved colleagues or people that we know to that men's event. The focus of our men's event is going to be evangelism. Evangelism and reaching out. See, I said he's going to come preach at our, our event. And then Stefan's going to look after the men uh, with, the, with the, the rest of his meetings, we're going to do two uh, Awaken events. Uh, Jolene's got some plans for that, so she's going to share uh, with the ladies what you are going to do in February and in August. And then Venora is carrying on with the women's ministry. She's got a, a great women's ministry meeting every second um, Saturday. I would encourage you, if you don't join that yet, please join her. The ladies are praying together and sharing really amazing things together. Bible school will always be a focus for us. So David and his team... Uh, we'll carry on with it. And then there will always be other ministries. There's marriage ministry. We want to do a finance ministry next year as well. But we need to focus. I really feel the Lord is saying we can't do everything. I've been, I've been there trying to do too much. Calendar is smashed. Events back to back. You burn out and uh, you lose focus. And in the end, in the end you become kind of an inch thick and you know, a mile wide. And your impact becomes less. So I really believe that the Lord... Um, 
through Jolene and I and through the leadership has, has called us to focus on these six areas. Is anybody excited about this? Yes. <laughs> Amen. So as the band comes up, I want us to, to stand together. Now the word of God in Psalm 16 verse 3. Sorry, Proverbs 16 3. It says, commit, commit your work to the Lord and He will establish your plans. Proverbs 16.3, commit your work to the Lord and He will establish your plans. And so that's what I'm wanting us to, to do this morning. But before we do that, I've got a final slide up for you with three questions. It's the right one. And the first question that I'm wanting to ask us all this morning, I'm not going to call anybody to the front this morning in particular, but the first question I'm wanting us to respond to as a church this morning after listening to this is, are you ready to love more people? And the Lord has come and He's challenged me very, very clearly. He says, Richard, this is, this is amazing. You've got all these amazing plans, building projects and exciting things. And we can get excited about that, but we can also get carried away and we can lose focus. What this is all about. And He took me back to the original word He said when He gave me, when He said, come here. And the conversation that me and him had was around love. He said, are you ready to love people? I was panicking about coming and being a pastor. He says, don't panic. Just open your heart and let me give you the capacity to love people. And so everything that I'm speaking about, all six points, all the exciting ideas, if it's not underpinned by love and a conviction to love people, then we can leave all of this. Then we can carry on. We carry on as we are. The Lord will be fine with that. But what we're not going to do is run in a direction and get excited about things and miss the whole point. And so, the challenge I want to put you out, this morning I'm just putting out the challenge. You don't even need to respond to the challenge. I just want you to reflect on the challenge. Because we're going to spend the whole half of next year getting ready for the challenge. Getting equipped Getting, understanding what it means to be a fisherman, understanding what it means to be a shepherd. We're going to go on a training course together. And God, not me, God and the Holy Spirit is going to make us fishers of men and fishers of women. So don't panic. He's told us that the, the boat must be bigger. The Lord must lead us in this. But what He wants us to reflect on today is the state of our hearts. And so all I want you to do today is to say yes, I'm open to be challenged to love more people. And if you're like me, you're way selfish and you'll say, Lord, I'm not there yet. I'm way too concerned about my household and my things and my needs. And the Lord's going to take us on a journey to love others because that's how we will be known in this church. We will be known, hashtag known for love. And Christ said, you want to be my disciples? You know how... The, the people in this town will know that you're my disciples by your love. And so I feel called to, to, to challenge you. If that's you, every eye closed, I'm not going to call anybody front to the front. If you're ready to say, Lord, give me a bigger capacity in my heart to, to love people, I want you to raise your hand right now. 